Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Down in Boca Chica, Texas, SpaceX is continuing to work on the BFR. And finally, they're getting around to testing a booster. So there hasn't been much Starship activity in the last month because it's all about boosters all the time. There is a booster on the test stand. We think it already did a pressure test and now it's getting engines installed so they can do a proper cryogenic proof test and potentially test fire with a large number of engines. Now this booster, we don't think it's actually going to fly. They think there's another one that's going to go for that. And we know what the flight plan is because they had to perform, uh, make FCC filings for the communication requirements. And this included the trajectory. The combined booster and Starship is designed to launch out of Boca Chica, head out east across the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, after stage separation, the booster will perform a flip boost back, but it will then land offshore. It probably won't land on a landing uh, pad because those aren't ready yet. Um, Starship will then continue downrange and thread its way through the Caribbean islands, trying to avoid fly. It, the trajectory very carefully carries it to avoid... Uh, as much land as possible. After that, heads across the Atlantic, across Africa, uh, Indian Ocean, Indonesia, and then into Hawaii, into the Pacific north of Hawaii, where it'll perform. The Starship will perform an aerodynamic descent and uh, landing in the ocean. And again, landing in the ocean about sixty miles north of Kauai in Hawaii. And I'm not sure if that's going to be recovered or not, but. Um, we know that they're not going to land these on barges because, first of all, Phobos and Deimos, the two large platforms, are still in docks getting modified. And the existing ones, you know, of course I still love you and just read the instructions. They're just too small. Like, of course I still love you, by the way, just got moved to the West Coast. It got put on a barge called uh, the Mighty Servant, which carried it through the Panama Canal. And it's being offloaded right now in Long Beach to support a number of launches by SpaceX out of Vandenberg. Um, there's a new one though, which just was, we just got saw some video off called A Shortfall of Gravitas. And there's a nice little drone shot of this. This is basically the same frame. It's like a Marmac, I think the designation is Marmac 302. And it's, so it's the same sort of underlying chassis as the other barges, but the hardware seems to be vastly improved. This was shown at sea making some speed, so it looks like they're no longer going to need the tugs to pull these out to the ocean for land for you know landing and bringing them back. They will still need support ships because you can't have people on the barge during the landing, but uh, a shortfall of Gravitas looks a whole lot sleeker and high-tech. And hey, you know, it's another name inspired by Ian M. Banks' culture novels. But yeah, it, it is kind of weird that people are like, surely you're going to try and recover these very expensive test articles. And th of course, that's something that didn't make sense. <laughs> like, previous to SpaceX, everyone was dumping their boosters in the ocean or on land. But uh, now that SpaceX is doing it, people are now horrified that they'll be dropping their boosters into the ocean again for testing. And that's what they did with the Falcon 9. They would land it in the ocean to show that they could actually land it. And only after a few failed barge attempts did they actually get to perform a return to the launch site. And then they stuck the landing for the first time. Anyway, look, SpaceX are pushing hard for this flight. Uh, at one point, and I think they're still saying this, they're, they're saying the intended flight date is July, which I don't believe for a second. It's, it's Elon time. But at least one of the regulatory findings, uh, filings to put a Starlink antenna on Starship itself, I think that has a start date of August 1st. And, you know, yeah, obviously that's not going to make a July launch. I think, you know, if they make it before the end of the year, that will still be incredibly impressive given the size of this thing. They'll probably beat SLS to an orbital launch, which is, you know, of course... You, you can do asterisks and say, well, this isn't go isn't a full vehicle. But I actually don't want to talk about this booster test flight. There's been a lot of speculation about it. Uh, I want to talk about a piece of hardware which was sighted on the booster. This here is a photo by Brady Keniston. And what you can see is a whole mass of plumbing and some little, what look like thrust chambers and nozzles. And of course, a cute little face in there. I haven't quite figured out who that is. Everybody looked at this and said, oh, that's a hot gas RCS thruster. And, and so, of course, I took this picture and I explained on Twitter 
why SpaceX want to move over to hot gas RCS because it's more powerful and because it will use the same propellants as the main engines. And pretty much in the next few hours, some guy called Elon Musk got into my Twitter mentions and said, oh yes, this is all very cool, but they're not going to actually fly on the first orbital test flight because they're basically trying to get this thing working and cold gas RCS is where they are. They've tested these RCS pods already. We, we can hear them testing at McGregor. We, like, we don't see them testing because nobody flies drones over it or anything, but you can hear these things being tested because they don't sound like a regular rocket engine. The, the thing about RCS thrusters is they need to be able to provide like thrust inputs very quickly. Think about you're playing Mario and you're pushing the buttons in different directions very quickly. Just imagine every time you push up, you have a rocket thruster that fires. So you can hear these things at McGregor if you're outside. So anyway, we know that these things are out there and, and they exist. And you might want to know well, what is the difference between the existing system and this new fancy hot gas. So yes, existing system is called cold gas. That's where you have a high pressure cylinder of nitrogen, you have a valve and then you have a rocket nozzle. And when you want that engine to fire, you open the valve and the gas just goes through that nozzle and gives you thrust. It gives you pretty low performance. The specific impulse is about 60 seconds. Um, hot gas thrusters is where you have a regular rocket engine, where you have a, either a monopropellant or a bipropellant. They mix and ignite in a combustion chamber and you get thrust. And in that case, the thrust is much better. The specific impulse is about 300 seconds in, at some you know, high-end performance. So yeah, that's four to five times better, which is much, much better. But the real advantage is on Starship, it will mean that they are using the same propellant for their reaction control thrusters and their main thrusters. It means that they're not having to deal with nitrogen and it means that they're also not having to deal with other typical propellants that are used in reaction control thrusters. Most reaction control thrusters in space, they're very small engines designed for basically rotating the vehicle and translating and everything. These very small engines generally need to be able to fire quickly and stop quickly. And they're usually pressure fed either monopropellant using hydrazine that gets decomposed with a, a catalyst. Sometimes they use peroxide like they use on Soyuz or they use bipropellant hypergolics where you mix the propellants and they just explode instantly. So those are usually monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. And that's what they use on the Dragon, for example, or the Space Shuttle. So that those hypergolic propellants, they're very toxic, but also they're completely different from the main propellants used to launch the rocket. So if you can get a thruster which uses the same propellant, that obviously simplifies a lot of your systems. And NASA actually tested this in flight on a vehicle called Morpheus. Morpheus was a you know, technology's test bed. They wanted to do a whole bunch of uh, interesting tech. They had uh, a meth methane oxygen uh, pressure fed engine as their main engine. It had RCS thrusters, which were cryogenic. And they were, this was one of the first vehicles to fly with cryogenic RCS thrusters. They used the methane and oxygen from the main tanks and they demonstrated that they could control the vehicle. Um, it also had like cool auto navigation and landing discovery and navigation. It was great. But that is somewhat different from what we have in Starship. So in Morpheus, the main engine there was a pretty simple pressure fed engine. And that meant that the propellant tanks had to be pressurized to fairly high levels. What we have on Starship is main tanks pressurized to maybe three or four atmospheres. And the Raptor engines include their full flow stage combustion cycle, which means pumps, pumps that raise the pressure up maybe as high as oh, 300 bar, right? In the 300 atmospheres in that combustion chamber. So if you took that three atmospheres of pressure and used that to uh, you know, work a, a reaction control thruster system, you would get some pretty anemic thrust, right? Simply, you just, it needs more pressure. 
So for Starship, you may have this thruster uh, assembly already figured out, but to support it, you're going to need a separate high pressure propulsion and fuel system, fuel and oxidizer tanks. And like for the test flights, those will probably be separate tanks. But if you imagine a starship that's going to be flying to Mars or the moon or whatever, it's actually more likely that what they'll do is have little pumps or compressors that will take propellant from the main tanks and will pump it into these little tanks and then pressurize it to the relevant volume. And then after they've used the RCS, they can pump some more in. So they don't need to have these high powered pumps like in the engines. They can have much lower powered electric ones that let them just replenish their attitude control heart uh, propellant over time. So uh, there is another thing that has been mentioned about these is that most people, I think based on comments that, that uh, Elon has dropped, think that these are going to be gas, gas thrusters, uh, as opposed to liquid, liquid thrusters. So Morpheus, they used liquid oxygen and liquid methane, and those were fed directly into the thrusters and they generated thrust. But gas, gas is where you allow the stuff to vaporize before it actually reaches the combustion chambers. There might be some uh, like heat exchanger involved that makes sure it gets boiled beforehand. Um, but like there's some versions of this where you would have separate high pressure gas tanks containing the me methane and the oxygen in gaseous form. And the advantages of this are, there's a couple of advantages. First of all, when you're dealing with a liquid, you have to blow it through fuel injectors, which turn it into a fine mist spray that mixes very quickly and provides combustion. You lose, that, that adds complexity. Uh, it, the ignition is slightly harder and it takes a little longer to warm up and get up to speed. So gas, gas on the other hand, you don't need these fancy injectors. The ignition and startup is very, very fast because it's already in gas form. But also, if you're in zero G and you have a propellant tank and you try to drain a liquid off it, there's no guarantee that you're going to get liquid. You might get the gas bubbles at the top. But if you have a gas tank, you know you're going to get gases. So this is one set of speculation that says this is what they might be using for these. Um, yeah, there's some, there's some other ideas here, by the way, because... Lunar Starship also has these other engines at the top, and there's a lot of speculation that these will be pressure-fed engines as well, just because they're trying to develop them very quickly. They might be like a scaled-up version of the Kestrel engine that was used on the second stage of the Falcon 1. Be, obviously, it wouldn't be using kerosene and liquid oxygen. It would be using you know, methyl oxygen. So it would be Kestrel on meth. Uh, these are needed because they don't want to use the main Raptor engines for landing on the moon because of the amount of uh, regolith that would get blown about. But it turns out, yeah, a Kestrel sort of scaled engine, large numbers of them, could very easily land a several hundred ton rocket on the moon using pressure-fed engines. So anyway, while development continues on Starship, it is worth noting and realizing that while the vehicle looks broadly similar to what we uh, was suggested, looks like it's fully functioning, it still has a lot of internal systems that are still being developed and tweaked, right? There's a lot of things that we can't see which will evolve and develop over time before we reach the final product. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Mm -hmm.